Hello again, this is Hillary with Waterlogged and today I've got a second part of our fish food series videos with Dr. Jesse Sanders. Today we are going to talk about how to read a fish food label. Now I don't know about you guys, but if you're like me, you probably have a bunch of different fish food containers sitting around at home or when you go to the stores you see all of them and you're trying to figure out which one is best for your fish. So today we're going to jump in and talk about ingredients, what's required on labels, and I'm so excited to be doing this with Dr. Jesse Sanders, who is the owner of Aquatic Veterinary Services based in California. Hi, Dr. Sanders. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you very much, Hillary. Like I said before, I love doing these videos and nutrition is one of my favorite topics. So thank you very much for the opportunity to do this lovely label explanation video. I'm going to jump right in. Um, and essentially, we're going to look at, you know, standard fish food labels on a lovely jar or box, however you have it. Um, the label is going to be broken up into two components. So starting out with the guaranteed analysis, this is those crude, you know, protein, fat, fiber, moisture, and then the list of ingredients. So we're going to start with two separate methods. Uh, we're going to start with the analysis and break it down from there. So right. as far as what is required by law to be on packaging, um, from the America, uh, the Association of Animal Feed Control Officers, uh, is the minimum percent of crude protein, crude fat, maximum percent of crude fiber and moisture is always required. And that's right. it. <laughs> that is all that is required. So people that are listing other stuff, you don't have to have it on there. Certainly it's nice to know all those vitamins and mineral requirements. We don't have levels for that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's on there. At least, you know, they're in there. Uh, just one quick note on the crude method that is mentioned here. Uh, it has nothing to do with petroleum products. Um, it's just the method of how the testing was done. So you can, you know, this is essentially the cheaper way to do guaranteed analysis. Uh, you could do the super fancy one, which is what's most required for human, you know, consumption, which is why it just looks a little weird on the label to most people. You know, it's funny, before we filmed these, I posted some polls on my Instagram and asked people what they wanted to know about labels. And one of the things that people asked was, what does crude mean? <laughs> so I'm glad it's like one of the first things we hit. <laughs> yes. Again, it doesn't have anything to do with petroleum products. That's what a lot of people, their brains just jump right there. Uh, but no, just the method of testing. So no worries. <laughs> uh, those min and max levels will vary by element. Um, and essentially they just taken a bunch of different samples, pulled them all together. And this was, you know, the minimum and maximum across that various testing. So when foods are trying to, you know, come up with a new formula, they have that tested. So they're trying to, you know, make it fall within a certain range. They might have to add a little bit more of this product, a little bit more of this one in order to kind of put it where they want to. So it's a lot of a balancing game across those samples. Cause you know, every batch isn't going to be identical, but at least it will have these in there. So we'll have our protein, our fat, fiber, moisture. Again, those are the required ones. You might have phosphorus. This is an important mineral in fish, um, not found in a lot of you know freshwater systems. It's more kind of in those saltwater systems. So it's on a lot of the freshwater labels. Um, ash is has nothing to do with wood pulp. That is essentially the mineral content. Basically, when you boiled everything off the ash and minerals is what's left in that tiny little sample cup. So that's why it's called ash. Vitamins, not, we not have- a bad thing. No, definitely not a bad thing. And then vitamins, as you can see, this label has them all written out by minimum. I, we don't know what's required in fish. I can't make heads or tails of those levels. I'm sure, again, they're extrapolated. A lot of the stuff in pet fish is extrapolated from aquaculture. Might be from a little cat dog thing. I really don't know. I can't say anything if those are adequate levels or not. So again, we're trying to take the nutritional requirements from so many different species and boil them down into one comprehensive thing. So we'll do our very best. But yeah, so it's a little hard. So looking at the protein and fat requirements, these is this is what's going to vary the most significantly across a lot of different containers. And essentially, you have to consider the fish that you're going to be feeding. Obviously, starting out with species. Are they carnivore, going to need more protein, lots of animal products? Are they herbivore, don't need as much protein, lots of plant products? Or are they somewhere in that sliding scale in the middle? Now, most pet fish species, they're going to be in the middle somewhere. 
So protein's gonna be very hard to judge. Obviously the age of the fish. So juveniles developing fish, they need a lot more protein and fat than mature fish who are just cruising around maintaining their body. Again, trying to grow really quickly like a lot of fish do, they're not gonna need the same amount of food and requirements that those guys have already built everything. They're, they're good to go, they're cruising. <laughs> metabolism, so again, fish are ectotherms. So their metabolism is tied to the water temperature. If you have a fish in say a marine tank, tropical freshwater tank, their metabolism is gonna be fairly consistent. You go a little bit too cold, fish are not gonna be happy in many respects. But say you have a urethermal fish, like a koi or a goldfish, that's used to a very wide range of temperatures. So, you know, everything other than the fish frozen solid up until that 85, uh, 29 degrees Celsius range, their metabolism is going to vary widely. And a fish that's colder really doesn't have a lot of metab metabolic requirements compared to a fish in warm water is zipping around real fast. And then obviously reproductive activity. So egg carrying females need a ton of of protein and especially fat to make all those little spherical eggs, mostly fat, and they have to have fat resources for when the fry emerge from their little happy little cocoons. And an immature male is probably on the end of that other spectrum is he's fine. He's just building up that testosterone for later use. He's, he doesn't need any extra fat or protein at this stage. You know, it's funny, if you if you guys are watching this and you're not familiar, there's actually foods out there specifically formulated for reproductive fish. Actually, one that comes to the top of my mind is LRS. They have one that I think it's called Fertility Frenzy. That's, that's the name of it now, but it used to be called Who's Your Daddy? <laughs> no. I have a shirt like that's where they got that. I have that shirt that has Who's Your Daddy on it with the little, with the little hippo tang. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> that's where that came from. All right. <laughs> yeah, so there are very specific foods um, that are made some for, you know, the baby fish, they need that higher protein and fat requirement um, versus the, the males, they obviously got to beef up to get it on. Um, there's, there's a wide variety of diets available to most consumers. So lastly, we're going to look at activity level. So you have a fish that's actively zipping back and forth. Obviously, they're going to need more protein and fat than one that just kind of hangs out, sits on a rock doesn't really want to do anything. It really just depends on what that fish is up to. So now we're going to look at a bunch of different freshwater tropical fish foods. So right. here we have them broken down into, again, this is just that analysis. We aren't looking at ingredients yet of protein, fat, fiber, and moisture. Again, these are just, just what's required on the labels. And this is the problem with trying to do a one size fits all for hundreds of different tropical species. There's just such a range of proteins and fat and fiber. Again, a lot of these fish, they can't really eat all that fiber. So that fiber of 7%, I definitely not consider that one. Moisture <laughs> is gonna vary a little bit of a pellet versus a flake, but this is a mixture of flakes and pellets and it's pretty much all the same. Interesting. So again, depending on the species that you have and all those different other considerations, one of these diets might be super awesome for your fish. Again, we're looking at those higher fat foods. Do you have a fish that's, you know, still growing a little bit? Do you want them to make lots of babies? Are they swimming a lot? Those higher fat foods are probably going to be better for them than, you know, just a general maintenance requirement. And again, around 5% is most of the fat requirements for most adult fish. That's not going to be the be all end all. Fat is su certainly super tasty and it's really good to make a calorie dense diet that a lot of fish like, but a lot of these fats, especially in some of the diets I looked at, they're unnecessarily high. So if you're able to pick something, you know, that one, that's like a five, six, seven, that's certainly probably going to be a better fat. And with all those, the protein varies quite a bit as well. So it's hard to make any sense of this, except just when you're going into it, you have to have, okay, I have this species that, you know, more herbivore, you're probably looking lower end of the protein spectrum, more carnivorous, you're looking at the higher end. And the fat, again, adults, we're going to try to keep it fairly low. Juveniles, we're going to push it a little higher with the reproduction in there. Fiber, try to keep it as low as you can. Um, moisture, as long as you're not paying a ton for extra water, as you can see, those are all relatively the same. So that is just for freshwater tropicals. We're gonna throw marine fish in there and make things a whole lot more confusing. 
So with this, we now have an insane range of proteins. So that D food there is listed. I found two different protein just label analysis. So I don't know which one is correct. Um, obviously this is a great food if you are a juvenile fish or a reproductively active fish. That fiber is nice and low. It's got not a lot of moisture. It has insane fat and protein. So this should not be fed to a fish that is just cruising around content with life. Um, obviously, again, we have that big range. You have amongst the fibers, you have that one outlier at seven, probably not the best option. You're looking at, you know, others between two and four, that's a lot better. Um, fat, we again have a lovely range between six and I'll just drop that last one off of 12. So almost double the fat. And again, if your fish isn't reproducing, not growing, you don't need all that fat. So now that we've dropped those off, we kind of have another range of protein. So again, looking more herbivorous down at the lower end, carnivorous at the higher end. And this might just come down to the ingredients. So obviously this is just a part to get you started. And certainly if you know, you're looking for X amount of protein in a diet, that'll at least narrow down like, okay, I should start looking at these different foods. And then you can break it down further, looking at the fat, the fiber, moisture, it's required, not really that important. Um, and then we'll look at the ingredients after that. So again, just random eight different foods that I found. This is a wide range. I tried to pick foods that were targeted at a broad spectrum population, which again, picking one size fits all for all these different species, it's just not, not possible. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of this information, again, we're throwing a lot of numbers at you, but it really helps to come in with, okay, I have this species of fish, they are in this life stage. Do I want to make babies? Yes or no. And then how active is that fish? So start with that. That'll at least kind of put you on the right path to where you needed to be. Exactly. But in conclusion, again, we don't know enough about individual species of fish. This is kind of just extrapolated from data that we have in aquaculture. There are some ornamental aquaculture facilities that help with this quite a bit. Um, if you're familiar with rising tide at all, they've been doing a lot of work with, you know, individual species, trying to nail down the reproductive diet. But again, that's a small percentage of that fish's lifespan. So great, great jumping off point. We have more data, data than where we used to be, but we really don't know enough. I, I mentioned the Who's Your Daddy fertility frenzy blend. I think actually that's one of the ones that is used at uh, rising tide conservation. Yes. Some of their that's where network. I got the t-shirt from. It says rising oh. tide in the front and who's your daddy on the back. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's great. Um, so really it's important to read the label before you buy anything. And this is great for online shopping because you don't have to be standing there in the pet store having to make a decision right then and there. Yep. And obviously compare, if you're able to collect, you know, all these different, like I want a protein of this range. It's like, great, here's six different products. And then you break it down towards the fat and then the fiber and then the ingredients. So certainly if there's an outlier among those products, it's not a bad thing. It might just be for a fish that's doing something else with their life, which is fine. <laughs> there's really no one size fits all diet. Like we said in our nutrition, it's probably with a mixed species tank, it's gonna be a mixed diet approach. So if you have a bunch of foods you like, great, use them all. I'm sure your fish will love a little bit of variety rather than the same thing day in and day out. I know I at least like to eat something different every day, at least a little bit. And you know, some of the other videos, if, if you guys have seen them, I talk a lot about enrichment for your fish. And one of the easiest methods of enrichment is just swapping up the different kinds of food that you're feeding, like. Yep, change the texture on it. If you wanna, you know, give them some fresh stuff versus some frozen diets. And that way they at least, you know, get a little bit of variety in their, in their day. Yeah. Always good for fish, especially those that kind of get bored and start destroying things like dogs. Mm -hmm. Puffer fish. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's lots of fish that like, I don't have nothing to do. Oh look, a rock, I'm just gonna go flip it over 40 times until it's wedged behind this other fish that's now trapped behind another rock. Yeah, sounds, sounds about right. <laughs> yep. All right, so that again was just the analysis. So now we're gonna be looking at the ingredients. And this is where, unfortunately, you probably have to pull the dictionary out. Because a lot of these supplements are listed by either their scientific name, 
They're listed by, again, a vitamin or mineral premix, just listed as that is completely legal. Um, most of those are pretty cheap and affordable. They will include all the vitamins and minerals your fish could probably possibly want. <laughs> uh, but we're gonna break this down a little bit further. So here is the ingredients for just an example diet. Uh, this is a saltwater diet. So you can see all the different ingredients listed out here. Uh, obviously some very simple whole Atlantic or Antarctic krill. Obviously, very, very easy to read. Whole fish, sure, that's completely legal. It doesn't have to specify white, brown, or parts. It's just fish. Um, some of the other ingredients, whole wheat flour. Um, this actually is broken down into both proteins and carbohydrates. So to make this a little easier, we're going to take all these ingredients and pop them up into a big spreadsheet of protein, fat, carbs, vitamins, and minerals. Some of these fit in multiple categories. So I tried to select the big ones to try to, you know, keep them at least kind of where they're supposed to be. Cause a lot of these, they'll, they'll be fit into more than one of these categories. So do the best you can. Um, the only one that didn't really fit into this list was garlic. So garlic is a probiotic. Now, a lot of fish foods have prebiotics and probiotics fairly commonly these days. And there's actually pretty good research, again, taken from aquaculture that these have benefits for fish. So certainly fine to add, um, we don't really know the levels for these that much. And again, it's not going to say on the label. Uh, well, some of them have the, again, the lactobacillus, uh, the brewer's yeast and stuff like that. Sometimes those are listed. We don't know those requirements. Great. It's in there. Hopefully it's still alive. Hopefully it's still supposed to do what it's going to do. Um, but yeah, we have, we have good research that these are actually helping fish. So great to add. Don't have to add it, but it's certainly something you can have. So now that we have everything broken down, we're gonna pull up the guarantee analysis with this as well. So now that we're kind of looking at this diet as a whole, are we able to quantify, is this diet good? So obviously consumer, is this actually a good diet for my fish? So really what you wanna look at is the protein sources. So the fewer protein sources that are listed, means that they have used more complete protein sources that are therefore more expensive and have more of those essential amino acids. So fewer proteins are good. If they have anything that is listed by their scientific name, that should be a little bit of a red flag that maybe these aren't the greatest protein sources. Um, certainly it's fine. I mean, it has to be a complete diet, so they have to make sure they have all 10. It really just depends on what's important to you as a consumer. Okay. So there's some carbohydrates in this, not very many. Again, with carbs, they don't really process them that well. So that should be a very, very short section. The protein, fat, and fiber are pretty good, actually. The fiber is nice and low. The fat's fairly low. Proteins, you know, at the lower end. But this is going to be good for a lot of omnivore and herbivorous species. Um, price for 150 grams is only 10 bucks, which... Sounds like a pretty good deal. So in conclusion, I buy it. This, this is okay. a, good, a good food. I like it. Um, so again, it takes a lot of work to get to this stage, but mm -hmm. obviously sitting at home, you know, just take an hour, take like a couple foods, do them like this. Obviously a lot of them are going to have those same ingredients. So you kind of brain starts to process what all those different things need and you can kind of lay it out a little bit easier. So in comparison to this, we have what's called Better Diet B. So essentially what this has is fancier packaging, but we're going to break it down a little bit more. Now, in listing out those protein sources, the last one I think had five or six. This one has nine, two of which are listed by their scientific name. So that should be a little bit of a red flag. Something's not really right with this. Um, other fun things about this was they had clam extract, which I'm assuming is a taste enhancer. I have not seen it in any other diet. They also had extracted marigold flour meal, which marigold flowers, they have, uh, of the, they're one of those pre-probiotics, but I've never seen it extracted before, which <laughs> is a little bit odd. I don't even know how you do that, to be honest. Um, but those, those two, they don't fit on that ingredient breakdown. They kind of just, you should think a little bit more about that. Now, this has a very fancy label. It has it listed, everything is listed on here. It even has the, 
Bacillus uh, simticulus, which is one of the pro, uh, probiotic brewer's yeasts in there. So it's a very fancy product, um, but it is $8.75 for 40 grams. And this is three times the price for more protein sources, including synthetic sources. Mm. So essentially you're paying for a pretty package. Um, I would hard pass on this guy. Um, again, something, something's not quite right. Again, with this diet, you have higher protein, higher fat, which is fine if you have a fish that's more active, but you're probably paying for packaging at this point. And if, if you do your research and you look up what this food is, it will make you question a little bit more about this whole line of foods. So it, it'll make sense once you figure out which one it is, but it's just one of those things that you gotta look at it and kind of take this into consideration that you're probably paying for something that your fish aren't actually benefiting from. Look at what you're buying. So it, again, it depends on you as a consumer. If you really want your fish to have clam extract, that's fine. They also make frozen clam diets that probably taste a little bit better and are probably better for your fish. I was, I was gonna say that, I'm like, well, you could buy clams and just give them clams. Yeah, I know, that's, I mean, clam, X means that clam juice. It's just, I, I don't know. You mentioned whole fish versus like parts of the fish is fish meal. What, is there a definition for that? All things fish. Uh, All things there fish. is really <laughs> no set definition. Um, certainly you can, they, the most pet food manufacturers are gonna make it sound as best they can. So obviously whole fish sounds like a whole fish. It's probably just whole parts of the fish. Um, you know, fish meal could be anything. A lot of the times it's, you know, the leftovers after they've taken the fillets off. So, you know, it's a little bit of meat, a lot of bones, a lot of good internal organs. So really good protein sources. Again, we don't like, I mean, people don't like to eat the insides of fish, which, which is fine. Fish yeah. love them. They're the best part. You have a dead fish. That's the first part they're going to go for. So <laughs> again, I, and unfortunately, the standards of labeling is kind of dropped down. You know, you have humans, you have cats, dogs, fish are at the very, very bottom. So a lot of the labeling requirements that are required for other pet foods are completely slipped by for fish. There's a lot of stuff on there that probably shouldn't be labeled as it is, um, but nobody's gonna check it. So now, here's something, and I've heard this, I don't know how true this is, that so how we do things in the United States as far as labeling goes and requirements for food is a good bit different than how they do things in Europe. I've heard in oh, Europe yeah. they have a little bit, okay, significantly higher standards. Somebody once compared it to like, it, it's at the same level of like food grade as like baby food, if that makes sense. Wow. Not true that I have no idea what other countries are requirements. Again, every country is able to make their own requirements. Um, mm -hmm. AFCO is just what we have here in the U.S. and for fish it's very lax. So yeah, I mean all these definitions are available on the AFCO website. So that's the uh, Association of Animal Fe Feed Control Officials, uh, officials AAFCO. Um, they have all the nutritional guidelines available for all types of pet foods, um, fish and aquaculture included. Some simple guidelines. So count your protein sources. So the more proteins that you have in there, the less complete sources, and therefore they're cheaper ingredients. If you have proteins listed by their scientific name, and this will either be with a DL dash or an L dash. Okay. Again, this means that they use cheaper, less complete protein sources. And neither of these are bad. It's just, they're still complete diets, but you know, a premium price tag on a food that's usually not great protein sources, you gotta kinda wonder where their money's going. So again, they're both still good, complete diets, um, mm -hmm. but you might be paying for something, again, that's not gonna benefit your fish. So finishing up with how to properly store our new wonderful magical fish food that we have just purchased. Uh, most of the containers you get from the store that have a resealable lid are just fine. Again, most importantly, you want something airtight that is opaque. So anything that comes in a cardboard box on a cardboard package that doesn't have a plastic insert to keep the food, probably not the best idea. 
Um, again, they make these cute little like tiny little storage containers for cosmetics and stuff like that that work great for fish food, especially if you know you're trying to keep a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Okay. We recommend that you keep it in a consistent temperature environment. So keep your fish food indoors, even if you have outdoor fish and try not to store it under your fish tank. So again, just temperature variations too much, especially if your tank's gonna be nice and warm above, kind of creates that nice little moldy environment underneath. Mm -hmm. um, so recommend, you know, just keep it in a kitchen cabinet with the door closed. That's, that's what we recommend for both, most people. Um, if you buy in bulk and try to freeze the leftovers, um, unfortunately, you're gonna be damaging some of those water soluble vitamins. So it's really not recommended to buy fish food in bulk. Um, certainly, you know, if you have a container of say pretty good pellets, they'll maybe give you about six months shelf life. Again, you're opening them every day, sometimes multiple times a day. So no matter how many times you open them, every time you do that, some of those water soluble vitamins, including vitamin C are going to be lost to the environment. So then we have the pellets versus flakes. So you take a pellet and you smash it and you get a flake. <laughs> Unfortunately, in doing that, you increase the surface to mass ratio. So a lot less water can evaporate from a pellet than a flat flake. So unfortunately flakes, you can maybe get three months out of them if you really take care of your container. Pellets are gonna last you about six months. And again, this is mostly focusing on the vitamin C content, which is critical for fish immune function. So if your fish are off, not acting right, getting sick, please consider your fish food. I know beta is the worst example. I've never seen a beta finish a container of food, no matter what <laughs> size it is. They're just never going to finish that in a timely manner. So it's critical that, you know, just write the date on the top as soon as you open it, be mindful of where you keep it and it'll really last good. you, you know, a lot longer than what you, what you start with. So that's kind of the general guidelines on how to read a nutrition label. Again, it's going to take effort and probably a dictionary or a computer. I just Googled half of those and it, you know, pops up right away. A lot of those things, pretty standard names for things. So try to start with the analysis and then you can work back from the ingredients. Cause if you start with the ingredients, it's going to, you're going to get lost. <laughs> and that, that's a good recommendation. And something I will add if, cause you were talking about vitamin C and actually I learned about the vitamin C from you at one of your webinars, mm -hmm. um, because I've got three fish in my tank. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not going to go through a jar of fish food before, you know, six yeah. months. But now I know that once it gets past a certain point, I like to add some vitamin C to sure. it and let it soak in there for a while. That way, you know, I don't want anything to happen to Frank. So. Yeah. <laughs> Frank needs his vitamins. Yes, he does. Yeah. So yeah, that, that works too. If you're able, again, if you're a lot of those concentrates um, are more shelf stable than what they put in most fish foods. So again, those, those two will go bad over time, but as long as you're kind of just using them on a conscious level to make sure that you're applying them correctly, that should certainly help with the vitamin content and vitamin E too. That's the, or uh, uh, B that's the other water soluble one. Vitamin B needs to be, have lots of different things. There's so many different B vitamins and they, they're also water soluble half of the, most of them. So just gotta keep yeah. that in mind. Like I keep speak, talking about products, but there is another product actually. There's a multivitamin that I like oh, to use. Perfect. Now I'm going to go and like, look at the ingredients and figure out like what vitamins are in there and make sure yep. that like these sees everybody. It's yes. Very important. Uh, it just, you just got to pay attention. Don't go on what, you know, the guy at the store tells you is his favorite food. No, no offense to the guys at the store. I'm sure you know your top seller, but there, again, there's just not one size fits all for fish. So what's good for your tank is not going to be good for somebody else's tank. And it depends if they want to pay a little bit extra. Cause again, they think the more expensive food is better. Absolutely yeah. not. Price have absolutely no gauge on how good a fish food is. And that is throughout all the different marketings, koi food, beta food price has absolutely no guarantee that you're actually getting your money's worth. Yep. And it's always like always super important to do your research too before, like don't rely on, you know, whatever other people have said or, you know, you can take it into consideration, but make sure you're doing your research before you're buying stuff, before you're buying your fish, before you're buying your fish food. Oh God. Yes. Yes. <laughs> lots, lots of research goes into tanks, species, diets, maintenance, equipment, everything. everything. Plan ahead. Exactly. Plan ahead. And you're going to have a more successful, happy, longer living fish. Yes. Just take it from Frank. So 
exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, yes, I would like to put my spokes, be the spokes fish for all these good fish foods. I fit great on the label. <laughs> when we were filming the video for showing how to make some of the DIY fish foods, like he was super excited because I was letting him like taste test them all. Oh, there you go. Huh. One lucky cowfish. Yes, he is. He's <laughs> spoiled rotten. <laughs> it's good. We like spoiled fish. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for telling us all about how to read a fish food label so that we are better able to make smart and informed decisions. Um, thank you so much. As always, if you guys have any questions or if you really liked this video, make sure you leave a comment, let us know, subscribe, hit that like button, all of the things. <laughs> and if you're not already following our channels, make sure you can go on Instagram. I'll have all of the information below in the video description. Thank you so much for joining me. 